morning, everyone. Great to see you, and good to have the opportunity to share uh, the next part of our Life Hacks series. I kind of wondered if everybody actually knows what a Life Hack is. Some of you probably know the lingo. Some of you probably probably don't a little bit. So I, I did hunt. It's like some Life Hacks. Uh, well, a life hack is meant to be a good idea that makes your life easier, right? So some life hacks are very good. Other life hacks, they're just eh, so-so. Some life hacks are so bad that they're good, you know what I mean? And so I, I wanted to find a couple here just to kind of illustrate what a bad life hack uh, might be like. Have we got that um, screen with a couple of photos there? So, uh, the, like, if you're in a hurry for cooking meals, the one on the, the left is not recommended. Like. If you're a bit too impatient to boil water to get the pasta done, don't put it in the toaster. Um, or if you kind of think, hey, I have a pet. It's not doing much. And the house is a bit messy. Those, you can't quite see it, but those are like little, um, little floor cleaners. And you put them on the cat's feet. They've got those little booties. He doesn't look very happy, does he? He's kind of... Anyway, those are bad life hacks. They, don't, they probably won't make your life much easier. We're kind of interpreting this term. You can take that <laughs> picture down now. Um, we're talking uh, about life hacks in, a, in maybe a slightly different way because there are some things that can hijack your life and throw you off course. Kind of, they want to hack into your life. And so in this series, we're looking at some examples from King David's life. And, uh, and our key verse has been this one from 1 Samuel uh, 16, verse 7. Let's have a look it up here on the screen. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. Pastor Bill started us off last week with a message about understanding our origins. And if you weren't here, you didn't get an opportunity to hear that, jump on our YouTube channel and have a listen. It was a great message, talking about how our origins can shape our lives. And this week, we're talking about what it means to be great in God's eyes, greatness in God's eyes. We might have a concept of what greatness looks like in a worldly sense or success in a worldly sense, but greatness in God's eyes is much different. And so I'm going to talk about what that looks like this morning and what it really means when we live for Jesus. If we only look for success in the eyes of the world, then we become proud and we become conceited. And pride is, is often described as an insidious thing. That means it's kind of very difficult to see in our lives sometimes when we're being proud. We don't even realize it sometimes. And it's even harder to point out to other people. I want to give you a couple of worldly examples of how pride can set in and how, um, how in these occasions, um, some, some people were humbled. Um, in the area of fame, who remembers back in the 60s, there was a band called the Beach Boys? Yeah? All that surfing stuff, you know, let's go surfing now. Well, that's what they were kind of well known for. Anyway, in 1966, they released an album called Pet Sounds. And they really went to a new level in their creativity and their songwriting, their lyric writing, the way they were, the way they were crafting the melodies. Uh, it is uh, um, probably, probably their, their greatest album. And they were getting lots of pats on the back saying, wow, you, you guys are amazing. And, and they were sitting around thinking, yeah, we're pretty good. It doesn't get much better than this. We've, we're kind of at the top of our field. And then a couple of months later, the Beatles released the Sgt. Pepper's album. Now, Sgt. Pepper's is very often voted the top pop rock album of all time. It was its 50th anniversary last year. It went to the top of the charts again when they re-released it. What's that? I know all my Beatles, yeah, I know my Beatles details. And um, so the Beach Boys were a little bit humble. They're going, okay, the game has changed it again. And the funny thing is, one of the things that inspired the Beatles to make Sgt. Pepper's was actually the Pet Sounds album. They listened to it, the creativity, the instruments. They thought, hey, we need to stop our, step up our game. And so it's one of the things that, that encouraged them. Here's another example of, of when pride sets in. Um, there was a company called Motorola 
in the 1980s and, and 1990s. And uh, they were mostly known for making car stereo units. Uh, and they uh, had the very early mobile phone market. In fact, we were saying before the service, um, they actually created the, the analog phone network, didn't they? And so they had the majority of the mobile, that early mobile phone market. And they had, do you remember those little flip out phones? Yeah, and it was a small, it was a cheap phone. And they became very proud of, of, of their phones. And, uh, and they refused to believe that when the digital market came in, that their customers would, would switch over. In fact, one of their, their board members actually said, oh, all our customers can't be wrong. They love us, they'll stick with us. And they refused to believe the evidence of their own eyes, everything that the market specialists were telling them. And within two years, they dropped to having 10% of the market, and in the next couple of years after that, into oblivion. So success in the world comes and goes very quickly. And, uh, and so that's not what we want to aspire to. Now, we're going to look at uh, 1 Samuel 18 today. If you've got a Bible there with you, you might want to flip open to it. We'll have the passages up here on screen as well. But I want to give you a little bit of background. I'm going to compare um, two characters from this passage this morning. We're going to look at King Saul, who was kind of on a bit of a, a downward trajectory at this point in his life. And then we're going to compare that with David, who was, was very early on in his story and how he responded so let's have a look at this. We're going to start with Saul. And I think the, the big learning curve with Saul's life is that pride comes before a fall. Well-known saying. Give you a bit of background to, uh, before we get into this um, chapter 18. Saul really fell from favour with the Lord. I mean, he fell big time. And if you have a look through the preceding few chapters, uh, chapter 14... Saul broke the law by acting in place of the high priest. And, uh, and he was a bit laissez-faire about it. He was you know, not terribly repentant, uh, wasn't seeking God's forgiveness. And so the, uh, the prophet Samuel comes in and says, what are you doing? Like, you know, stuffing it up. And, uh, and then in this kind of very odd uh, scenario, his son Jonathan eats some honey, wasn't meant to eat the honey, and, um, and, and Saul flies off into a rage. You shouldn't have done that, you've broken the law. I mean, when he's just broken the law himself, hello. But he flies into a rage, and he actually says, well, that's it, we have to put you to death because you've broken the law. He wants to kill his own son, which is crazy. And, um, and it takes a whole stack of his advisors to say... No, we don't think you want to do that. And they actually protect Jonathan and stop Saul from, from that, just that crazy, impulsive want to attack. Then chapter 15, that's where it all starts to kind of fall apart. The Lord tells Saul to kill the Amalekites. They were a very evil group of people, uh, idolaters, um, bad people. And Saul says, okay, you need to go out and attack them. Leave nothing standing. Destroy it all. Take nothing for yourself. Problem is, and Saul doesn't do that because his soldiers get in his ear and they say, oh, well, can't we have some of those sheep or some of those horses or can't we just take a few things for ourselves? Come on, it'll be good. You know, so we'll, we'll, we'll sacrifice them to the Lord. It'll be a good thing. And so because Saul wants to be popular in the eyes of his men, uh, he gives in and he lets them, uh, lets them take it. And, and Samuel eventually comes along and, uh, and, and Saul has a case of VRG. Do you know what that is? He has a case of verbal religious garbage. Saul comes to see him. He knows exactly what Saul has, has done, and Saul greets him. Oh, bless you in the name of the Lord. Like, and Saul just sees, uh, Samuel rather, sees straight through it and says, what have you done? What's this bleating in my ears? That's what it says in the scriptures. What's this I can hear? Oh, we did it in the name of the Lord. And Samuel sees straight through it. He says, no, you did it in the name of yourself. 
You did it because you wanted to be big in the eyes of your, your soldiers, in the eyes of your men. And so at that point, it says, God regretted ever making him king. That's pretty strong language. And, uh, and he made it very clear that Saul's disobedience meant that he was no longer the anointed one. And so then the next couple of chapters, chapter 16, Samuel goes and meets David and says, yes, David's going to be the next king. And, uh, and then David meets Saul, kills Goliath. We talked about that last week. And, uh, and so Saul decides he's going to keep David around because he's a good harp player, he's a good musician, and he's also a good fighter. And he has a lot of success uh, on the battlefield. And so he says, well, we're going to keep uh, David around. And that's where we're going to pick up the story in chapter 18. I'm going to start from, from verse 5. And we'll have it up here on screen. It says, whatever mission Saul sent him on, David on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the troops and Saul's officers as well. And when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing. So they come out to meet Saul. They come singing these joyful songs with timbrels and lyres, and as they danced, they sang. So you've got to picture this. They're kind of, they're lining up in the streets. It's a big celebration. They're getting caught up in the hype and the fun of it all. Hey, you know, it's, it's great. Saul has killed his thousands, but David's killed his tens of thousands. They make up this little song. Good thing we don't have the music to it, and it's probably not something we'd sing as congregational worship. They make up this song. They get caught up in the hype of it. And uh, Saul's response is really interesting. It stirs something up in him and brings something out in him pretty ugly. Have a look at this. Verse 8. It says, Saul was very angry. This refrain displeased him greatly. Because they've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. See, Saul fell into what we call the comparison trap. He felt belittled because people were giving praise to David and not to him. And it brought out the green-eyed monster in Saul. You know what that is? Envy and jealousy. He started to look at David and think, well, why are they praising him up? I think he probably looked at the relationship that was forming with, with David and Jonathan, that they had become really good friends. And, uh, and Saul might be thinking, well, I'm not even that close to my son. Why, why is he you know, spending all that time with, with David? And so maybe Saul's feelings uh, of insecurity came out in that as well. In fact, it says it made him so angry, he tried to kill David with a spear. So you've got to imagine it. David's there playing his harp, you know, beautiful music. And, uh, and Saul was sitting on his uh, throne. He's holding a spear. And it says, all of a sudden, he just pegs it across the room at David. Fortunately, he was a really bad shot, and he missed twice. And so, uh, so David kind of ducks, gets out of the way. He's kind of thinking, well, what's, what's this all about? And uh, so he, he manages to, to uh, evade Saul on that occasion. But I think deep down, Saul knew it was over. It says in uh, verse 12, Saul was afraid of David. There was a deep fear that had set in. And it says, because the Lord was with David, but had departed from Saul. And so Saul was observing that. He could see that the writing was on, on the wall. There's a saying, what goes up must come down. And, uh, and in terms of his success in the world's eyes, the, the, the people before him, Saul was about to crash spectacularly. It's interesting that Saul never really uh, repented of his, his actions when he broke the law. Um, he was never really contrite of heart. He, he panicked. He tried to get it back and was saying to Samuel, tell me what I have to do. Tell me what I have to 
to do. But he was never really repentant. He never really brought his heart before God and, and uh, asked for forgiveness. And from that point on, Saul continues to crash. He stops following God altogether. Uh, at one point, he even goes and consults a witch um, and, and somehow tries to get her to tell the, tell the future so he, he can find out what's going to happen. And, and ultimately, he ends up committing suicide on the battlefield. So it's a very sad uh, finish. So what goes up must come down. I mean... This was illustrated to me this week watching some of the press uh, on Roseanne Barr. Here she is, hit TV show comes back. It's the most, second most successful television show on American television this year, meteoric success. She gets on Twitter and starts saying things. She puts out one tweet, racially offensive comment, and, uh, and within 24 hours, the network cancels her TV show, her management company drop her, the co-stars of the TV show, some of them, publicly denounce her, and you see this meteoric fall all of a sudden. And, uh, and it's quite complicated and layered. There's politics involved and, and all sorts. But what an example, hey? What goes up must come down. Nothing lasts forever. The challenge for us is to not let things like envy, jealousy, comparison, anger or bitterness, don't let those things into your heart because ultimately those things will come out. Whether in your speech or in your actions, those things will come out. And so don't let them take root in your heart because it leads to a big crash. Well, that's Saul. What about David? Let's have a look at David's example. Because David was a totally different kettle of fish. If pride comes before a fall, then humility comes when we humble ourselves before God and before others. Uh, it says in the next part of the, the passage there that in everything David did, he had great success. Success, in the, in, at least in the eyes of, of the world. Because the Lord was with him. The Lord made him successful. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all of Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. He was a strong leader. He was a strong personality. I mean, David is a complicated character in himself, but he was obviously a very lovable person. When, when it says all of Israel and all of Judah loved him, they really looked to him. And so David experienced worldly success and greatness in the eyes of others, and yet he wasn't proud about it. He didn't then kind of look for his self-worth in that. And David had such a heart after God that he was always seeking him, always submitting himself to God. Not a perfect person. I'll come back to that in, in a moment. Anyway, Saul can't handle this. So he comes up with this crazy plan. doesn't even really make a lot of sense, actually. He thinks, I'm going to marry David off to one of my daughters, to Merab, um, and then I'll have some control over him, and I'll send him off into, to fight the Philistines, and he'll get killed in, in, the, in a battle with the Philistines. David humbly refuses, and he says, I'm not actually good enough to be the king's son-in-law. That's what he says. That's how he views himself. So then Saul finds out one of his other daughters, Michal, is in love with David. She really is attracted to him. And so he thinks, uh, Saul thinks, well, maybe I can catch David out by marrying off to, to, to Michal. David, again, demonstrates his character and a little bit of his uh, inner thinking about himself. Uh, some of Saul's soldiers try to convince him that, yes, you should get married to, to Michal. And this is what he says in verse 23. This is really interesting. He says, do you think it's a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? And look at this. I'm only a poor man and little known. Let's pause there for a second. Really interesting. He did not call himself the giant killer. He didn't call himself the one who kills lions or bears or he's killed the tens of thousands. He could have let that go to his head, but he didn't. Instead, he actually sees himself through the lens of his weaknesses. In fact, it's almost 
a, a, like a false humility because he's putting himself down. I'm not worthy. I'm just poor. I'm little known. We can do that sometimes. It's very easy to, to speak of ourselves. And we might say, oh, no, I'm just joking. I know I do it all the time. I'm just short. I'm just bald. Not much I can do about that. Isn't it good to know that God knows us so intimately that he even knows the number of hairs on our head? Which in my case, it doesn't take him very long to count. But, uh, you know, we can make flippant comments like that, but actually it reveals insecurity sometimes. And I think that's what David was doing here. Anyway, Saul, in desperation, says... Look, I don't even want money because that was the culture. You pay a dowry for, to, to get married to someone's daughter. Um, you know, I don't even want money. He just says, just go out and get the foreskin of 100 Philistines, which seems like a really bizarre dowry to pay. And I haven't done the, 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 the Bible study to find out what that was all about. Aren't you glad we just signed a piece of paper these days? And uh... Anyway, the whole plan backfires. And uh, it says that when Saul realized that the Lord's with David, he sees David having success, and that his daughter Michal loved David, she really did love him, Saul gets even more afraid. Because I think he knows the writings on the wall at this point. And he remained uh, David's enemy for the rest of his days. Look at this though, verse 30. The Philistine commanders continued to go out to battle, and as often as they did... David met with more success than the rest of Saul's officers, and his name became well known. Now, David was not perfect, and he wasn't always submitted to God. None of us are perfect, right? Uh, in fact, after Saul tries to kill him, David goes off, does a little bit of his own thing for a while, doesn't, doesn't lose it badly, but you know, he has a group of men with him. He's got to provide for them, so they go off looting. and um, It's not fantastic. He hides away from Saul. He's is, is perhaps not really seeking God. Um, but he's then restored, and eventually David becomes king. You can read that in uh, uh, the beginning of 2 Samuel. When it came to being a husband and a father, David really crashed quite badly. And we're going to talk about that, unpack that over the next couple of weeks. Um, As a husband, his infidelity, his lust, his the way he viewed women, and then with his kids, he was not a hands-on dad uh, in the same way that perhaps his dad had not been around for him and 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 taught him in the ways of the Lord. Uh, He was not there really to raise his sons, and so we'll, we'll unpack that a bit. But where Saul had been. Openly disobedient to God, David was obedient. And it says that, particularly when it came to war, it says in 2 Samuel that the Lord gave victory wherever he went. And he is a complete contrast to Saul when you look at those two men and compare them with each other. It reminds me a little bit of two prime ministers we had going back a few years ago. Who remembers 1993, Paul Keating... He wins the election, which was pretty much the unlosable election. The opposition was not strong on that particular occasion. And he gets up to the podium, and, uh, and I think it must be something about elections and, and winning them. Something the, the, the truth comes out, doesn't it? it re- they reveal something of their, their heart and their inner thoughts when they get up there. And so uh, once it was clear that, that Paul Keating had won that election, he got up and he said, victory is sweet. And I think he even licked his lips as he said it. I might be going overboard there, but that's just my recollection. It was 20, 25 years ago. He said, victory is sweet. And he wasn't, he was, he was proud of his, his achievement at winning this election. Well, three years later, the next election, he loses to John Howard. And John Howard then won the next three elections. Do you know, even at the third time that John Howard took office, he got up at the election and, and in his speech he said, I'm humbled by the response of the Australian people. I'm humbled at this uh, election into office. What a contrast, hey? Victory is sweet, pride, and yet humility in ongoing success. 
The learning point for us with David is a no-brainer. We regularly need to allow God access to our heart. Allow him access to your heart. Open your heart to him. Allow him to see all that's there. To be submitted to him. Submit your ways to him. Submit your thoughts to him. And to be humble before God and others. See yourself as he sees you and not through the old filters like David did. And the examples of David and Saul are very helpful, but the very best example of humble living that we can look to in God's eyes is Jesus. Jesus humbled himself. Here he was, the son of God. Humbled himself by coming to earth, born as a little baby, in lowly circumstances, born to a poor young couple. He lived an ordinary life. He learned a trade. Became a carpenter like his dad. He didn't seek fame or fortune. Crowds followed him once he started his ministry. It didn't take long for the word to get around and a crowd would form around him. Yet he didn't seek that. In fact, it says he just wanted to be about his father's business, doing what he saw the father doing. He didn't define himself by what others thought of him. He let the healings and the miracles speak for themselves. He even said that, didn't he? I think to John the Baptist's disciple, he says, go back and, and, and just tell John what you've seen. Let those things speak for themselves. He humbled himself when he died for our sins in the most amazing way. And he made a way for our salvation. And it was something that we couldn't earn in our own strengths or ever repay that debt. But the cost of then following Jesus and becoming more like him is, is a different story, and it's a challenging one. It is a challenge to follow a selfless, sacrificial saviour. On two occasions before sending out his disciples uh, to do ministry, and then also again before the Last Supper, he said this to his disciples. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must, what? Deny themselves. Take up their cross. Follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me will find it. Those are hugely challenging words. Deny ourselves. What does that mean? I think it means to deny our own wants, our own desires. To die to that self inside. And seek what God desires in place. To take up our cross. You know, we all have burdens in life. Ultimately, Jesus has won it all at the cross. He's covered our sins. He carries the burden for us. But when he says, okay, now you've got to take up your cross. Life circumstances that we all carry. And in the same way that Jesus went to the cross, we have to carry those circumstances with dignity and courage. It helps us to do that. To follow him, to walk in his ways, follow Jesus' example. To lose our life. That almost seems like an oxymoron, doesn't it? To say, if you want to save your life, then you have to lose it. That doesn't make sense. But this is where Saul really missed out. He tried to hold on to his life. He tried to hold on to his, his kingship. He tried to hold on to the fame and the adulation of, of the people around him. If you try and hold on to it you lose it. That's really no life at all. Instead, finding our new life in Jesus, seeing ourselves as Jesus sees us and following in his ways. And so our response is that we should really live to please an audience of one, not to be worried about what others think of us and others say of us, but live to please our Heavenly Father. See, it's not wrong to have worldly success. You know, when we have Eloise here in a couple of weeks' time, she's been a worldly successful person, but her heart is submitted to God. It's not wrong to have success or to want to achieve, but it has to be done with humility and submission to God. And really, his response is all that matters. When I was a teenager... And I was on our music team, and uh, 
probably about 18 or 19, and uh, I, I co-wrote a, a worship song with a friend of mine. And we were really excited about this, writing our first worship song, and we wanted it to get it in, played in church. So we kept harassing our music director at the time, keep saying, Just, we reckon you should do this song. Tried to keep putting it before him. You don't have people doing that to you, do you, Tanya? No. I haven't done it for a while, have I? No, I'm kidding. So we kept saying to our music director, come on, we, we want to sing this, this, this song. Come on, we reckon it'd be good. Anyway, he liked the song, so he eventually he said, yeah, okay, we, we, we're going to do it. It's a good song. So they did it, and, uh, and I think at the end of it he said, and that was written by a couple of guys over here from our, from our youth. So we had people coming up to us afterwards, partners on the back. Hey, that was good. I didn't know you could write songs. Wow, that was When are you going to write the next one? And getting lots of praise, lots of adulation. We're just soaking it up. <laughs> the irony is the name of the song. Some of you might even remember we used to sing it. <laughs> Humbly I come before your throne. I lay myself down before you. We couldn't have been less humble about it, I think. But anyway, it was only a day or two afterwards, and I was having uh, coffee or having a catch-up with uh, David Wabnitz, and who still leads worship at our 8.30 congregation, also one of our board members. And I think David, actually, I think it was probably a bit of prophetic insight. I think David saw that I was probably enjoying this a little bit too much and enjoying the, the buzz from it. And David said to me, he goes, well, that's good. I'm, you know, I'm pleased that it went well. He goes, but I want to share with you something that my dad shared with me. It was George here this morning. And uh, he said, yeah, my dad shared this with me. He said, whenever somebody gives you praise or adulation over something, he said, you don't have to have a false sense of humility. You don't have to say, oh, no, no, it's not me. It's just the Lord. Um, he goes, just say thank you, accept it graciously. And then he said, in your private times with the Lord later on. He goes, give it back to God. Always give it back to God so that you don't allow yourself to think that it's in your own strength and, uh, and so you don't become proud and conceited. And I've never forgotten that. And so whenever people speak, it's very easy when we're up here on a platform or before people, even in a small group, whether maybe you're a small group leader, you do something in a, a small group, it's nice to receive praise and, and encouragement. Nothing wrong with that. But give it back to God. One scripture that's really guided my, my thinking in many ways is Romans 12. For me, it's like a life verse. I often come back to it. I love this passage. And Paul gives some amazing wisdom here. He says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. See, we don't physically sacrifice ourselves, But it's that giving up of the self putting ourselves to one side, sacrificing our wants and desires and seeking God's uh, ways first. Holy and pleasing to God. This is true and proper worship. Don't conform to the pattern of the world. See, the world will just want to puff you up. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be transformed as you seek Jesus, as you follow his example. Then you can test. You'll be able to test and approve what God's will is for you. His good, pleasing, perfect will. What did Jesus say? If you lose your life, then you'll find it in him. And here's the important bit. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. And I think what he's really saying here is, okay, yes, don't think of yourself more highly, but you know what? Don't think of yourself, don't put yourself down either. Sober judgment means a realistic uh, view of yourself and seeing yourself as Jesus sees you. We have a new identity in him. And it goes on there, in, in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. As I bring this to a close this morning, I want to invite you to reflect on your own heart. And we're going to pray as a prayer in a few moments this beautiful psalm, which was one of David's psalms. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, God. Give him permission to search your heart. Know my heart. Test me. 
See, testing times do come. Allow God to test us in those things. Know my anxious thoughts. Submit even those thoughts to him that maybe you don't always want to. He's listening anyway. He knows what's going on in there. Submit them to him. See if there's any offensive way in me. This one, this one is critical. See if there's any offensive way in me. Lord, if there are things, little things, little spots, a bit of pride, a bit of envy, a bit of comparison, then I don't want to fall into that trap. Point out those offensive ways, Lord, and then lead me in your way everlasting. We choose life in him. Amen? Amen. Can we stand together? And I want to lead you in a prayer. We're going to pray this together and then have an opportunity for some, some prayer and some ministry. Let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. This is a time between you and the Lord. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are a loving God, that you love us so much. And you demonstrated that by sending your son, Jesus, so that each and every one of us can have new life. If we accept Jesus into our hearts, if we acknowledge our sin, then you make us new. You give us eternal life. Lord, we come before you this morning and we pray this prayer of David. Search us, Lord. Search our hearts. Know our hearts, Lord. We give you permission to test those thoughts, those feelings, those places where sometimes we don't want to go. Know our anxious thoughts, Lord. You know the things that tie us up bundles, the things that we trip up on in our thinking. Know our anxious thoughts, Lord. Point out the offensive ways, Lord. We don't want to cause you offence. We want to be like David, constantly bringing our heart back to you. And if there are areas of offence in us, Lord, then help us to be repentant. Help us to receive your forgiveness in its fullness, Lord, and to see ourselves as you see us. Lead us, Lord, in your way everlasting. Amen.